only married for two years. And he was away at the time that she died, looking for a decent property for them to live. Isaiah 57. The righteous perish, and no one ponders in their heart. Devote men are taken away, and no one understands that the righteous take away to spare from either evil. Those who walk uprightly enter in peace, that they rest as they lie in death. Crushed at his wife's death, he wrote a resignation letter to the London Missionary Society. I cannot write any more. My sorrow bursts forth afresh, afresh. As I go over the details, he concluded, I trust to give myself more completely than ever to the, mo the noble work on which I have just been entered. But at the present, I feel weighed down by deep grief. I am sure I have your sympathy and prayer that no trial, however gr grievous, should separate me from the glorious cause, but rather thank God for her peaceful, painless end and say the Lord gave, the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He loved his wife, but he loved the Lord more and he knew that she was in a better place. She went home to God and he knew that but he still didn't stop him from still wanting to do God's work. How many of us in a grievous heart lost someone and we just wouldn't be able to carry on because we'd be that hurting? This is how much faith and standing Robert had. Even though he lost his wife and his child, which is heartbreaking for any man or any woman to lose their husband. He was still standing firm in Christ. His heart was broken, but it was, he knew it would be healed because of Christ. After a while, Robert still carried on. He never went out. He never left. He kept going and wanted to do God's work. He moved to Chafoy near Korea. C H E F O O. Chafu. I'm trying Korean. I'm looking at Liz like Liz. <laughs> With his special ta talents for languages he was able to get a job as a custom officer. And there he connected with some other missionaries, <coughs> a Joseph Edkins and a, Zal and an, and an a Zandra Williamson of the National Bible Society. Seems to have trouble with my words this morning. Williams then introduced Robert to two Korean Catholic fishermen who was eager to have their own copies of the Bible. But in Korea, they didn't have Bibles. It was hard to get them. And the only Bibles that they could get hold of was in Chinese. But they managed somehow to get some Bibles in Chinese for these two fishermen. Now, I'm going to go back just a little bit, about 100 years, in 1700 to let you know that the Roman Catholics had already been in Korea and they converted a lot of them to Christianity already, over a hundred years prior to this, nearly 200 years prior to this, should I say. But because of that, this is where the problem in Korea started. They didn't, the government didn't like the Westerners or any other interference of the world. In fact, 
in the same year of 1863, this happened. The Korean government, or Korean authorities, slaughtered 8,000 Christians in that same year as John F F F Robert Jermaine Torres wanted to go to Korea. It was already dangerous. It was deadly, in fact. 8,000 that year got killed. Knowing this craved a deeper conviction in Robert's heart. Korea at the time was known as the Hermit Kingdom because anything foreign <coughs> influence was banned. Monuments were put up to warn the Koreas, the Koreans, that if they had any contact with the outside Korean, they would be killed. And then also the people they caught was in contact would be killed. I don't think there's any difference now. No. It's still the same in North Korea. Disturbed by the fact that 8,000 people died, Robert learned Korean. To go to Korea in the middle of this to still preach about Christ. He was going into a war zone where he knew damn well he, if he got caught, he would be killed. Yet, that didn't stop him. He lost his wife, he had death threats, yet nothing stopped him from preaching about Christ. Nothing. But God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and a sign mind. Thank you, Sean, for giving that quote to me the other day. I thought that would be brilliant for the sermon in this part. <coughs> because Robert had no fear. God did not give him fear. He gave him power to go into this war zone. He had no fear. Because like this scripture says, it is not given. God does not give us the spirit of fear. He gives us the power to stand firm and go forth. Not to run away. This man is a great example of what all our teachings and sermons have been in the past few months. And this is why I think this stood out to me. It's because this is what we've all been agreeing on in some way or form. What we have to do as Christians. As people who follow Jesus, this is his command and this is perfect example with this gentleman called Robert, Jermaine Thomas. And after all, he is Welsh. So listen to him, people. <laughs> Take him as an example. He's one, he's one of your own. Come on. You know? <laughs> Very local. Listen, just down the road. That little chapel that I showed you is still standing. <coughs> It's still used. They still use it. Even though the 8,000 was killed, the under <coughs> underground churches started that year because they wanted to know Christ. That's when the underground churches of North Korea started. And they're still there now, guaranteed. We know that. It's all down to this gentleman, this Robert Germain, why the underground churches are still going in North Korea. It's because of Robert Germain Thomas. Robert was the second Protestant missionary to be in Korea. The first one was actually a German gentleman. Here we go. I can't even speak Welsh, I'm my German. Let's all go. Carl! Gusloff, or Gusloff, something like that. Gustav. I have a go. I speak German better than Welsh. <laughs> <laughs> and he was in Korea in 1832. 
and he was giving out already Chinese Bibles. Because that's the only thing that Koreans could get hold of was the Chinese language. Helped by Joseph and Alexander, Robert B. and the Scottish Bible Society were, was able to get a load of Chinese Bibles and a load of Chinese tracts. Even though it was dangerous to hand them out and punishable by death for both sides, it never stopped him. In fact, his job as a custom officer helped him distribute it because he had to look through it, through the customs, have a Bible, have a track. <laughs> Stuck it in there. Great guy. <coughs> Stick it in because it's best off. Brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> but only, Robert only had this job for a couple of months. Because violence broke out near him. He had to quit. Because it was getting too dangerous. He knew that was that for that time but it never stopped him. As a well-educated scholar he was, many scholars kept a diary. I've got two days out of this diary. Let's have a look. November 3rd. You won't be able to see it, so... There we are. Right. November 3rd. This morning, a half a dozen junk men went ashore to catch some shellfish, on which three of them were cruelly beaten about the legs by cowardly islanders. Our little fleet of nine junk, he says, nine junk was a state of high ignition. You could send, we sent 50 men to fight. In their own fashion, they were immediately loaded with rusty, Matchlock, matchlocks and small guns with powder only, so they were shot at. And taking their Samson, or I'd say warriors, Sambons, right? I have to look up this. There's, oh, how many words, definitions was the word for Sam? To find out what he was saying, Sambons. The best I could get <coughs> was it was actually named from Samson as a warrior a fighter. So I assume he was talking about they picked their best warriors. So I think that's what he was on about because the other version I saw, uh, found was women disguised as men going into war. Which it also <laughs> could have been. No, the other version goes from Samson to women disguised as men <coughs> going into war. So I was, I was just like, hopefully saying it means warrior. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> They was flying their flags, beating their gongs that was made around the village. All the islanders congregated like a flock of white sheep at the top of the hill. Two or three of their fierce ones were going through all kinds of warlike manoeuvres on the near cliff. Steadily, our fleet advanced, firing volley after volley of power. And more, and more, a hundred, uh, they fired more over a hundred yards from the village. Two of the most daring boats advanced towards the shore, where by this time many of those from the hill had collected themselves and were engaged very vigorously in pelting stones. Nothing daunted, these two boats seized a small junk lying off the, off the beach in, his, in a trice, they had lifted the anchor, and amidst all the accommodations, accommodation, <laughs> brought away their prize. It is a small tub, and will be given up tomorrow. I'm really having trouble speaking this morning. I'm so sorry. November the 4th. This is why I think it's brilliant, because we're so close to these dates of <coughs> where all this happened. We're literally on his anniversary, nearly his, what, what's going to happen? This is all happening. November the 4th, yesterday was stormy. Today, two islanders fixed a small stick in the ground at the low water with a piece of paper attached to it. I sent my writer for it. The following 
was free translation. This is what it said. This for all to see. You are engaged in a contraband trade, a trade severely punished by our representative countries. Your vessel that came here is too given to disturbance. You have been you have been here already 10 days. You have dared to cut wood on sacrificed islets with a temple on it. In other words, they, were, they thought they was disturbing their holy ground. Rendenick was liable to tempest. Your guilt is very great indeed. As we have non as we have none who after the wood, you have taken it in thievish manner. You are all set as thieves. You indeed are dis desperate set. One of our military officers will come with thousand men who will do battle with you and slay you. But now we are willing to make it up and not report it. You must believe this document. The other day you snatched away a vessel. You must return it. And then we will not enter hostile feelings towards you. Be quick. Be quick. Well, after that threat, they found it too dangerous to carry on. So once again, Robert Germain Thomas backed off. But still, that burning conviction was still there to go in the midst of all this. After that threat, I'd be running the other way. You know what I mean? Stop smiling because I know you won't. <laughs> nah, I know you. But he's still standing firm in this conviction that he had to go in Korea to spread the word of Christ. Now, another opportunity came forth for Robert, a French naval ship. They asked him to be an interpreter on the ship. Yes, of course, Robert was jumping at the chance. Yes, I could go back into Korea. Yeah, all right. <laughs> you know. He's going in as an invading party, so they need an interpreter for the locals. But at the last minute, this French naval ship decided to go to Vietnam instead. So, <coughs> Robert felt left down again. He thought his opportunity had disappeared. No, I desperate, I definitely think God wanted Robert in Korea because another ship wanted an interpreter. And they was looking for Robert. They was actually looking for Robert to be an interpreter on this ship too. This ship was the General Sherman. It's not a bad little steamboat, is it? It had cannons on it, though. It was a little warship. A little train, a trade warship. I don't know how that worked that one out. So, it was spotted in, on the 9th of August, 1866. Going up, going towards Korea, Going up the lake, lake, going up the river, the, oh, it would go, Tangdong River. I really hope I'm saying that. And every stop he made, he was preaching to the locals, even though he could be killed at any time. Do you know how cocky Robert was? You might go, oh, oh we couldn't do that, but. I like how, what he did. He started throwing tracks and he was ripping the Bible pages out, throwing it in down the river as they were sailing so the locals could swim into there and pick a piece of Bible out. A little bit of paper, knowing God's word on it. Literally, because he, even though he was preaching on the shoreline, 
it'd be the Christ loves you, oh heck, we're getting back on the boat and going off. You know what I mean? But he was handing out the tracks in the river so it float down the river so people could collect them. Ingenious idea to get the word across in my eyes. August the 16th, as they were sailing up the Tangong River, he was doing all this. But I found something <coughs> interesting. As I was researching, I looked and found something from the Evangelical Times. He was describing this. They, this, this is why it was a bit hard for me to try and research this gentleman. It would have been easy if I had one book and went from the book. But I wanted to look into it a little bit more. And this is what the event, uh, Evangelical Times describes the crew. They describe the crew as robbers. They were a smuggling ship. Right? We don't know what they were smuggling. But this is what this account was about, that it wasn't a ship what they thought it was. So this is why the Koreans were very against foreigners, because they thought it was all smuggling things into their country that they were scared of. So they report it as a smuggle ship. But yeah, it was. I agree, it was smuggling. They were smuggling Christ into Korea. <laughs> you know what I mean? So yeah, I believe there was a smuggling ship, but not what they thought. They were smuggling Christ. <laughs> As they were saying, so back to the river, and the Tangog River, they started to struggle, because it was getting shallower and shallower and shallower. But that never stopped them, they was getting there, Two of, the land, two of the islanders got onto the boat to try and help them manoeuvre it to a better place and to get them out of the area for their safety. Because they were told that if they carried on, they would die by these two men. They were helping them so they wouldn't get killed. But they carried on. No matter what these two men were doing, the captain of the ship just carried on. Until... They reached Pen Pyongyang. Thank you. You knew where I was going. <laughs> the capital of North Korea. This is why I think they have picked this one because then I thought this could um, interpret the Korean <laughs> language for me now. <laughs> Anthony with the Welsh, Liz with the <laughs> Korean. Um, do two want to do this? <laughs> But finally, the ship did actually get stranded. It got stuck. What a great time for the government or the authorities and the locals to attack. This ship could not go anywhere. People from the island jumped onto the ship <coughs> with all sorts of weapons. Knives, sticks, machetes. They killed 14 crew members. The locals even decided to use their sailing boats as weapons and fill them with anything they could that they could set fire to and aim it at the Sherman to blow it up. They tried everything to their livelihoods. They gave up their fishing boats as weapons to get rid of these foreigners. That's how scared these Koreans were of their government. They were doing everything they could to stop themselves being killed. They turned on the Sherman. Because of this, and they had their local authorities. It didn't look good on the Sherman. They actually kidnapped three officials to try and calm the situation down. Sadly, 
two of the officials were killed by friend, from their own. One of them was rescued by an ex-military. But it didn't work. So on August the 31st, the Sherman fired back. With the cannons, the guns, they killed seven locals and injured five compared to what they did on the Sherman by killing 14. It's sad to say that these two of the three men, the top one was the one that was rescued, the other two was killed. I hope that's what they give that picture, so I assume it's them. I got them off the pages that I was researching. So I'm hoping I've got in that right order. <clears throat> but yeah, they began a little war. A little war. It's not a little war. A little battlefield, shall I say. People getting killed on all sides. Mainly the Sherman. But they was ready to battle. They got their thousand men, soldiers down. But by the time they got there, the locals had already blown up the Sherman with their makeshift fire. Because on the Sherman, because it was a, they had the guns, the cannons, there was good powder. One spark, ship gone. We don't know really what happened to a lot of things because there's so many different counts on all, <coughs> all sides. The Koreans are saying one thing, the Americans are saying the other thing. We don't know exactly what happened at the end. But we do know, I do know one thing, this is the account. In 1926, just jumping a bit forward. The Christian News found an article. A Reverend Lee Jambon, hopefully, who was a minister in the South Province, thousand miles away from where, where this all happened, okay? And this was like nearly 100 years after. This res Reverend had a distant relative. He was a soldier at the time this fighting was going on. He said this family member had told him that there was a gentleman <coughs> who was going to be executed. He was holding a red book tightly to the chest. He wasn't begging for his life. He was begging for the, execution, the executioner to take the red book. The red book was the Bible. The person that was being executed was Robert Germain Thomas. I've said there's so many stories, but I believe this is the true story because that's all he ever wanted never begged for his life, didn't care about his life. All he wanted was to bring life to the people through Christ. I believe this part is the story. Not that he was <coughs> killed, blown up on the boat, probably swam the river and got beaten up to death by the locals. I believe this is the true part, that all he wanted to do was give the executioner a chance to know Christ in Robert's own but this is the weird story this executioner was told by the government to kill this man his heart broke that day when he executed this gentleman he believed he killed a good man of Christ 
that was apparently his words to his family. He didn't have much choice but to execute this gentleman with this red book. And the executioner did take the Bible. In fact, it's a story saying that he became also a missionary. He preached the word of Christ from the spread Bible. It ran in his family after this. His family turned to Christ after the execution of Robert Germain. So let's go back. Sorry about that. Let's just go back to the explosion of the ship. So you can just imagine. In 1866, you've got a boat exploding. On there is Bibles. So you're expecting pieces of paper floating around. There was also a gentleman who actually went round picking her pieces of the Bible pages from the river, collecting them. He used them as wallpaper in his house. Oh, probably missed something on the wedding. He was picking them up. He picked them up as wallpaper so his guests could come in their house with no restriction and read the gospel. This is where the reckon the saying comes from. The writing on the wall, read the writing on the wall. If you've heard it, yeah? This is where they think this, that expression comes from. It's because reading the writing on the wall is reading God's word. Yeah? They got away with it. The authorities just thought it was wallpaper. And it was the Bible. Amazing. <coughs> this was discovered in the 1900s. And because of this, having the writing on the wall, in that area of North Korea, a hundred churches were planted in North Korea. In 1907, yes. oh hello, <laughs> <laughs> it became a major site for revival. In 1932, Robert Germain Thomas Memorial Church was open, in where he was supposed to have been killed. You know how the revival started in 1907? I couldn't find that. From the Welsh revival in 1904. Yeah. There we are. Mm -hmm. Once again, Robert Germain Thomas. It great. had to be. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad you actually said that now. It comes up brilliantly. Even though they did that memorial church, hmm, once again it upset the Korean, didn't it? The Korean authority, they sort of like knocked it down. But they think it's about <coughs> the, no the North Korean communist regime. But that didn't stop the Koreans appreciating the sacrifice that Robert Germain Thomas did for them to introduce them to Christ. In fact, there it is again, the Koreans come over here to visit Robert's church that he grew up in, that he did his first sermon. In fact, inside there, I know it's a working church because they've done a little bit of history as well. This is where I got it from. All their signs of advertising Christ on, uh, um, on their flags that are around is in Korean. It still has Korean influence in that chapel. It's still a working chapel to this day. And again, if it wasn't for Robert Germain's sacrifice, I don't even think Liz had been even in Korea. <laughs> and how many other Welsh ministers or Welsh minister, missionaries have gone to Korea 
just for this. Thanks to the opening of Robert Doreen Thomas. Romans 6, 4. We were then, therefore, buried with him through the baptism of death in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of his Father, we too may live a new life. That's what the Koreans did, thanks to Robert. And many people like Liz now in Korea, giving their life, giving their time to introduce people to Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if anyone in Christ is a new creation, the old is gone, and the new has come. That's Korean life. They appreciate Christ. They thrive. They thirst. They hunger for Christ. The North Koreans who know they could die have under, underground churches because they hunger for Christ. They want to know him. Where are we failing? Where's that hunger? Where's our thirst? Now you'll see the other side now, people. <laughs> right then, questions. How is anyone supposed to live if they don't know Jesus Christ saved them? <coughs> Answers, please, anybody? No? All right, next question. How is anyone supposed to be a new cre creation? if they don't know Jesus Christ? Do they cocoon themselves again and come out a butterfly? <laughs> no? Alright. So, last question. How do people get to know Jesus? Read the Bible. Read the Bible? Read the Bible? What happens if you haven't got a Bible? We tell them. I think this might be it. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I think this might be it. Yep. It's Tell you what, all of you, read it, memorise it now. Read it out loud. I think Alice is a great example of preaching the gospel to everybody she meets. Are you, Alison? Alison? You're a great example. <laughs> it's not just this passage it tells you in. I want you to memorise it. Go home and memorise it like this says. Everybody this time. Not just the BLC, because it's not the just BSB people that when you've got your qualification, you've got your diploma or what you're having, that's got nothing to do with it, it helps, but it's everyone's responsibility as a follower of Christ to do that. Amen. That is how people live, that's how people know about Christ, it's because it's our responsibility. Preachers. Just like Robert's responsibility, he, didn't, he knew the dangers, he had no fear. Oh. The last scripture, okay, last part. Mark 16, 15 to 20. He said to them, go into the world and preach the good news to all creation, all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. These are the signs that will accompany those who believe in my name. They will drive out demons and speak new languages. They will pick up snakes by their hands. They will drink deadly poison. Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Even though God will save it, don't. It will not hurt them at all. They will lay their hands on their sick, sick and they will be well. After the Lord has spoken to them, he was taken to heaven and sat at the <coughs> right hand of God. Then the disciples went out and preached everywhere. And the Lord worked with them and confirmed his word by the signs that accompany, the signs that accompany it. This is what we do. Look at Robert's example. Why are we scared? Why are we going out there more often? Why are we clutched up in a building? Alison, you do the right thing wherever you go. 
You speak the word. You speak the truth. I commend you on that. Oh, look, she's getting all his on. Sorry, she's getting all embarrassed. I'm sorry. Right? It's true. But Alison's a good example. Look at our own dawn in Uganda. Yep. She was another one that I was thinking about because she was definitely close at home. What she sacrificed to go and help people to understand Christ. Look at the boy she's saving through Christ. No fear. She sold her house, gave up everything, and went somewhere where she's been in and out of hospital, not had enough food to feed herself, not had enough food to feed the children, yet still stood firm in Christ. That's our own dawn from this church. Yep. She's, her and Alison are great examples of what we should be doing. Amen. <laughs> I received from the Lord what I passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. same way after supper he took the cup saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup proclaim the Lord's death until he comes
anybody been having trouble with their nose? I, it's been painful or, or something. Has anybody been having trouble with their nose? It's the Lord says he's willing to hear it. I don't know if it's you. I've just got that thought in my head. And I'm, I'm feeling that somebody's just had like the pain under their arm. Just here, you know, it's been painful as well. But the Lord's willing to heal. It's actually, it's, 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 it